Shall we go? Yeah. Let's do it. Great. Hello, um, my name is Toby Hulse from Rastabout Theatre and welcome to the second in our series of Lights Up On. Last week we spoke with Kate Cross, the director of the Egg Theatre in Bath, and that interview and the questions that followed are available to watch on our YouTube channel. Um, today I'm joined and very happy to be joined by Nikki Miles Wildin, um, who is the associate director, I believe, at um, Grey Eye Theatre. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's exciting right. to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. So this is um, a series of webinars um, about um, different career paths into theatre, the different jobs that people do in the theatre, and it's aimed at um, uh, drama students, uh, theatre study students, anyone considering a career in the performing arts, and also just for very curious audience members who like to know a little bit more about what goes on behind the scenes. Um, so, uh, Nikki, could I just start off by asking you to tell me a little bit about Grey Eye Theatre? Yeah, uh, Grey Eye Theatre Company are based in London, in Hackney. We've been going since, uh, freshly since 1981, but we were set up in mm, 1980. Uh, it's, uh, they are the UK's foremost disabled-led theatre company, and we're all about um, taking down those barriers for deaf and disabled actors, writers, uh, theatre makers, uh, and I'm putting our stories sort of centre stage. Um, yeah, we, we were set up by Nabil Shaban and Richard Tomlinson, who met at college in Coventry, and they wanted to dispel these sort of images of dis, um, defencelessness, uh, the prejudice and the myths that um, kind of surround disabled people. And they decided that they wanted to do this through, through theatre, through workshops and through training. And that's very much stood at the core of because even 40, 41 years later, uh, there were still those prejudices and those myths. Um, so yeah, we're still, we're still, I don't want to say fighting for our work. I suppose we are, we're still, we're still creating work that challenges uh, the mainstream, which I think is really exciting. Fantastic. I've been watching Grey Eyes work for, I guess, about 25 years now. Um, and I'm always surprised by um, how inventive, how innovative, how um, in fully embracing it is, how accessible it is. Um, some of my favourite theatre experiences have been watching Grey Eye shows and those of you watching who haven't seen Grey Eye Theatre's work, I, I urge you to, um, to once, we're, once we're allowed back in theatres, mm. um, to go and see them on stage and um, I'm sure there'll be uh, online offerings which we may well talk about later, um, to associated with their work. Um, so, uh, Nikki, first of all, I'm just, I suppose my big question is, um, we, I spoke with Kate yesterday, uh, last week about the word director, um, mm -hmm. which has many different meanings in theatre. Um, Kate Cross is an executive director um, and has um, administrative and organisational and visionary responsibilities for the egg. Um, what do you do as a director? What, how does, <laughs> what, does what a do I do as a director? <laughs> Uh, as I suppose um, for me as a director, uh, it can it can really vary. Uh, so you could be one day I can be just um, reading scripts, which is a big part of my job. Uh, another another day I could be in a management meeting. Uh, another day I could be in a rehearsal room, uh, researching and developing a project, whether that's with a writer or with a bunch of actors. Uh, I could be making work for young audiences, I could be working on community projects, uh, working with young people, or I could be in a rehearsal room making, making a production. And, and also leading workshops, facilitating workshops, whether that is around directing or uh, creative access, which is very much at the core of what kind of grey I do, of uh, making work accessible to, to anyone through kind of embedding audio description uh, into, into the plays uh, and also uh, kind of embedding sign language and creative captioning into it. Um, I can also, at the moment, watching a lot of online work, um, learning how online work uh, is facilitated. Uh, so yeah, it's. I think the work of a director is is really varied, and I've come to learn that. And also, you have to be a sort of business person as well, uh, understanding budgets, doing your own tax return, 
knowing how to write arts council applications uh, so it's not just all about art uh, it's it's uh, it's a many layered thing uh, i think we have to see ourselves as kind of what our hard skills are what our soft skills are mm. uh, it's not just all about being in a room and creating work and being a communicator it's about many other things on top of that that's and 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 that's the associate director at Grey Eye, do you have specific responsibilities there as part of that company? Yes, I'm head of new writing uh, at Grey Eye, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, and I lead on the Right to Play programme, which we've had coming into our seventh year now, which is where we've worked with a selection of writers from all around the country and paired them up with a mentor, of which you've been one, haven't you, Toby, to Anita? And also, uh, uh, allying those writers with a venue in their areas so they get to understand how a venue works we offer different master classes for those writers um, we, they get to have two weeks in a building uh, cups of tea with artistic directors chief executives literary managers get to meet actors they might even have the chance to kind of research and develop a, a script uh, and that's kind of an, been a nine month program for those writers and we're just coming to the end of those six years so we've got 30 alumni writers now which is really exciting uh, and a lot of those have gone on to write for radio for for tv uh, not just for theater um so and it's it's also my job is to kind of i don't want to say look after them because i don't feel like i'm uh, looking after them but to keep keep connected with those writers to see how the theatre, the cultural landscape is changing, where we can, where we're best placed to put those writers. And also now um, to think about what the future of that right to play programme is, how we're going to move it forward, uh, kind of take those early career writers and push them to more sort of emerging mid-career stage and what that entails. Lots of conversations with venues about that different uh, different theatre companies. Uh, I also, uh, we have a script uh, submission window, which is open to any deaf or disabled person that wants to send in a script. So I do a lot of reading. Um, I do, I also, uh, yeah, I, I work a lot with the creative learning department. So I run a lot of schools workshops. Um, I could be in, I could be all over the country doing that uh, from Plymouth, up through till Edinburgh, it can take me all over. It's really quite exciting. And just, and also, yeah, budgets. Uh, <laughs> I love a good budget. Um, it, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a really varied job. I get to make work as well, which is really exciting. Uh, I've also, um, I'm, really, I'm really keen to, uh, to push the disabled narrative further. Um, because at the moment, a lot of the disabled narrative is seen from the non-disabled narrative, if that makes sense. Yes. So it's always a non-disabled person telling us what a disabled narrative should be. And I'm like, nah, get off our <laughs> stories. Let us let us drive that narrative. So I'm really keen to do that. Um, so we started these events uh, at Grey Eye called Crips of Chips. Uh, where it was rehearsed readings, we uh, invited our right to play writers. Uh, we um, we set them a theme for life. Me, I can't remember what that first theme was, and they wrote on that theme, submitted their scripts, and we selected four of them to present. Uh, and people came along to our our venue in Hackney, to our little studio space, and they had the greasy spoon round the corner, provided bowls of chips for everybody to eat. Um, but it was it was fantastic because it was uh, disabled people. We don't get the same opportunities to make work. Fringe theatres are very rarely accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all know that when you're a theatre maker, it's really important to make work on that, on that circuit because if you can do it quite cheaply, you get your work out there, you see how an audience responds, and then you go, oh yeah, that didn't work. You know, it's a place for us to fail, isn't it? And that's how you learn is by getting work out there, seeing what, what works, what doesn't work, what do audiences want, what don't they want. And for us as disabled theatre makers, we don't have that true access. We can't get to those, most of those fringe theatres are up pub, up, upstairs in pubs with no lift access. Hardly any of them have captioning. Not many of them have audio description integrated. So I was keen to kind of bring that home to Grey Eye. 
So we've started up kind of rehearsed reading nights uh, for people to come, sort of scratch nights, try and work out. Um, so yeah, I've kind of implemented that with Crips of Chips, but then lo and behold, COVID struck. Mm -hmm. um, so managed to put that online now with a fantastic programme with support by Jack Thorne called Crips Without Constraints, which it's um, 11 disabled writers um, responding to what, whatever they wanted to in any way. Um, yeah, and they're on our they're on our website to watch. They're released every Monday, so I think. I would, yeah, I would. I definitely recommend that you um, you look for those um, monologues because they're hilarious, moving, entertaining, and they're 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 all so different, and um, it, it gives you a real insight into the work of Grey Eye and and what Nikki's been developing there. And I think um, I know there'll be people watching this um, now who possibly thinking about careers as directors. Um, and certainly I, I've worked as a director and um, one of the things that I realised very quickly is it's not like uh, it's not like it is at school. Uh, directing isn't about being the teacher at the back of the hall saying speak louder, move over there, second shepherd, where's your tea towel? Um, there's a, there's a, there's sometimes, a whole other... <laughs> sometimes it is, David, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> but there, there are a whole other set of skills um, and Nikki there's given us a really... Um, excellent description of the just the, the breadth of skills and opportunities and um, challenges that are, that, are, that are placed in the way of the director um, and the variety of the sort of work that you make. Um, how did you end up being a director? I mean what was your career path to where you are now? Quite a varied career path. Uh, I think if you ask my my mum and dad they were always like yeah she was born to be a theatre director. <laughs> like uh, I used to put on shows, uh, get my cousins and my sister in and I'd write little plays and kind of direct them as uh, that kind of director. Stand there, say it like this, do that, you move over there, watch your costume, all of the age of like seven or eight. Uh, uh, but I don't, I think it was, it was never something I really thought I wanted to do. I just enjoyed doing it. Um, I, uh, being a disabled uh, young person, I grew up in Gloucestershire in the southwest. Um, I, I had limited access to kind of drama training, even to youth theatre. Um, my mum tried to get me into uh, to a local theatre, and they said uh, we wouldn't know how to work with a disabled person. So basically, no and their studio wasn't accessible anyway. Um, so I kind of had limited opportunities. And I think I, Guild Guides for me was a good outlet for entertaining and drama. Uh, but I didn't fully get into it until I studied A-level theatre studies, I think. And it was there that I really found my passion. And I went from, I'm going to be an educational psychologist to now I want to work in theatre. It's just <laughs> what I want to do. Uh, and so I remember looking at universities to apply to, drama schools, had auditions for drama schools, didn't have auditions for drama schools because a couple of them said to me, uh, pointless spending time, three years training, there's no jobs for disabled actors anyway. Um, or, oh, you're, you're a wheelchair user, you can't, we can't get you in our building, all that. Um, so which when you're like 17 18 and you've got this real passion it's a real knockback mm. you know what i mean you like oh i can't do the thing that i've i love um and so i i went to university of glamorgan and i studied theater and media drama which was brilliant because it gave me an overview of kind of what theater was like what television what radio was like i met a lot of really good people um and I created a one woman show there uh, during my first year, which we took up to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival called Three Foot Off The Ground, which was about my experience as a disabled, disabled woman and what I felt like uh, growing up. Um, yeah, and that, I, I really found my passion, I think, for, for making work. And, and also found my kind of political voice mm -hmm. um, that I, I really started to see there was a lack of people like me out there um who, who was there on television who was disabled there were probably like two or three people mostly on Grange Hill um and I, I think I was I wanted to I started to get a hunger to challenge that um and then after uni I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm, what am I gonna do you know that kind of feeling um and then my mum saw an advert in the stage newspaper this is how long ago it was <laughs> and it was for um 
Arts Council England really were trying to get more deaf and disabled people backstage in theatres and they had an Arts Council apprenticeship at the Nuffield Theatre in Southampton uh, which I hold dear in my heart particularly during this, uh, this time um, and it was an 18 month apprenticeship for to be a stage manager working with the education department so we went down to Southampton had my interview and I, and I got the job and I started couple of months later and it was it was fantastic it was the best training ever being a stage manager i i was touring around schools driving a van with three actors two we were doing two shows in rep or the two sets in the back of the van <laughs> uh doing those early morning get-ins and get-outs at schools you do one show in one school in the morning move to another school uh, eating your lunch as you go, get to that other school, do the get in. Um, yeah, so, and also I got to um, be deputy stage manager on main house shows, assistant stage manager, I got to make props. Um, and I ended up, so I did the apprenticeship for a year and a half and then I stayed on for another year. And I just, it was, I got to see how a venue worked, mm -hmm. sitting on sort of some senior management uh, meetings, which was great. Uh, see how box office worked that relationship between backstage and front of house be in many production meetings and i think production meetings are really handy to sit in on to understand how the different departments work um yeah and it was yeah it was fantastic and then i think once i finished there i still had this fire in my belly i wanted to make work i wanted to perform uh i really wanted to be on eastenders um, and I saw an advert for, from Spare Tire Theatre Company, they were looking for a disabled actor, so I auditioned and I got the job and that was touring schools around London uh, doing a piece of forum theatre. And it's kind of from there my relationship with Grey Eye grew. I had become aware of Grey Eye when Jenny came up to see my show in Edinburgh. Um, but I started to become more affiliated with them, I was, I was in London during that time and just really interested in the work they were making so I yeah that I started to be uh, do a lot of work with Grey Eye I went on to work with uh, Birmingham Rep, the Wolsey Theatre I played Laura in the Glass Menagerie which was really exciting because that is actually a disabled role and uh, it was one of the first theatres to actually cast a disabled actor in that role um, and then I suppose my biggest uh, highlight as an actor was playing Miranda in the Paralympics opening ceremony London 2012 uh, where I got to fly through the Olympic Stadium mm -hmm. act along some alongside some guy called Sir Ian McKellen um, and that yeah you know in front, <laughs> yeah, who, who is he um, uh, and that was you know in a stadium in front of 70,000 people a television audience of about half a billion worldwide and yeah and I and I think that was biggest highlight of my career um, and I, I carried on performing a bit after that and acting I started to get bored because I wasn't being challenged as an actor I was getting cast in the same roles <laughs> I started to fall into those that same I don't want to say victim but those were the kind of roles you would be playing um, and I didn't feel I was being pushed enough um, and then I started assisting I assisted Jenny on a couple of grey eye shows um, and it's just gone from there really in the last five years um, lots lots yeah so I assisted Jenny I, um, I I worked on Tommy which is a Ramps on the Moon production mm. I was associate director on that tour to different venues I, uh, I got to meet Rufus Norris a few times at panel discussions and I got to assist him on Mosquitoes, which was a show in the Dorfman, uh, which was another career highlight because I got to give Olivia Coleman acting notes. <laughs> Obviously why she's gone on to be really, really, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm good at her job. Uh, and then from that, I got the uh, 18 months uh, resident assistant director job at the Manchester Royal Exchange Theatre through the Regional Theatre Young Director Scheme. And through there, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just really rocketed. It's really, mm -hmm. I, if you'd have asked me 10 years ago that I was going to be in this position, I'd have laughed. Because um, I've never thought of myself as a director. Mm -hmm. I think it's just having a hunger to, to make work and create work. Um, and I think I've kind of, 
yeah, I, I feel like there's nowhere else I want to go now. Fantastic. I, I feel um, like I've tried everything and this is it. <laughs> oh, there are many, many more things to try, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask uh, one more question, um, but I, before I do that, just to um, say to the participants, um, if you have a question that you'd like to pose to Nikki, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there's a little um, box called Q&A. Um, and if you type your question into the Q&A, um, we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Um, so uh, you mentioned just a moment ago the Regional Theatre Young Directors Scheme, um, which is one of the um, routes into directing. Um, but for those people who are interested in working as a director in theatre, do you have any um, advice or things for them to look out for? Um, or um, top tips um, which you'd like to pass on? I think top tips, advice, don't do it, no jokes. Um, <laughs> I, I would say talk to as many people as you possibly can, get into as many rehearsal rooms as you possibly can. I think there's one thing that I've learned by being in different rehearsal rooms is that there is no correct way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you respect the people that you're working with, it's, it's up to you how you create that work. Um, read lots of books, read books about acting as well as directing and also uh, writing books, books about structure and stories. Uh, watch, go to the theatre and watch as much, get to know whose work you like. Uh, also don't just focus on the acting, look at the, look at the sound and the lights, mm -hmm. um, video projection, how is that feeding in? Um, yeah, I think write to people, email them, Ask if you can go and just see what they're up to. Have a cup of tea with them, a cup of coffee, whatever you fancy. Um, just, just have a chat. Everybody is, what I've learned is that everybody is willing to do that. Yeah. And it's about, um, and as long as people at the top kind of leave the ladder or the ramp down, then we can help bring up the next generation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what is the most important thing. So yeah, find those people, go and have those chats. Look at RTYDS. They have lots of different training programs, JMK. Uh, for directors, um, there's lots of different programs out there. It's just worth worth hunting them out. And I would say, don't think you have to pay an extortionate amount of money to necessarily go and do an MA in it. Do that if you want to. But I think there's other routes in. Yeah, and just uh, to pick up on what Nikki's just said, um, we've we're offering uh, through Roust About Theatre anyone who's interested in continuing the conversations that we've started here with with the members of our company. Um, then please do email us at shout at roustabouttheatre.co.uk and we will try to either answer questions ourselves or to put you in touch with appropriate people. Um, we, all of us in Roustabout, have been helped up at some point by someone, um, someone we've had a conversation with or someone we've been lucky enough to meet or sometimes just as directors we've gone along and asked someone and um, it's a way I've found that all theatre makers think which is you kind of pass it on. You, yeah. pass that, you pass those opportunities on to other people. Definitely, uh, and I, th yeah. you, I think you learn from those conversations as well that you have with those people. Hmm. Uh, and, and also what I've learned is that everybody has imposter syndrome. Yes. We, we all think we're going to be found out because we're not sure we're doing the right thing. Uh, and also how we're, those people that you think are gliding along like swans, but underneath the water, their feet are doing this. Um, yeah, so yeah. don't think anyone is out of your reach because they're not. And that, um, for those of you who are not familiar with imposter syndrome, you will be, which is that feeling <laughs> that this time, I've, I've got away with it so far, but this time I'm going to be found out that I'm no good. <laughs> and yeah. it, happens, it happens to all artists, at every single project they start. Um, I've got a question here from uh, Robin, who actually is part of Roustabout. Um, so we've been um, experimenting, as many people have, with online work um, during this period. Um, and he's is asking us how can we make sure that our online work in particular is access is as accessible as possible uh you need to speak to people whose uh access requirements you're interested in because i i'm still struggling with this uh i could say if you put in a video on make sure it's got captioning see if you can have someone to do audio description um as a sort of separate soundtrack or even if it's integrated into that video but it's interesting and this is a conversation that's going around now in the disabled community and I'm trying to see what I can do as a maker but it's not as accessible to visually impaired people as we think it is so just because we think we've gone on to a medium that's easier to make work particularly at this moment in time it isn't 
and it's and it's creating a lot of barriers for people probably more so than what we are in theatres so I think if you're interested in uh, seeing how your work can be uh, can be made accessible have conversations with those people mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing that next week as part of my work at Grey Eye having conversations with some visually impaired theatre makers so I can understand as a maker what I need to do Right. Fantastic. I've got another question here, which is um, a bit more uh, artistic. Uh, what three things make a great production? And you can, probably go, you can probably go beyond three if you want, but let's let's start with three. Uh, Story. Do I care about the characters? That for me, that's a big one. Uh, that's two. Uh, oh, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Story, characters. Um, story characters and do I care because mm -hmm. I, I can go and see shows that have like fantastic sets and brilliant lighting and video design and I can be there and I go I just don't care mm -hmm. but then I can go and see uh, uh, a makeshift production something that hasn't got a big budget it could just be one person uh, but if I'm if I'm there with them, I'm like, yeah, I love it. So yeah, it's story characters, and if I care. Yeah, and um, it's interesting that you mentioned reading books on acting. I'm I'm currently teaching playwriting to some uh, teenagers, mm -hmm. and I had a, a complete revelation, uh, which was the questions that actors ask themselves based on Stanislavski. Um, those of you who are doing A level theatre studies, you'll be right with me here. Um, are actually the same questions that writers ask about yeah. their plays so um and story characters and do i care is uh, what it what what is what am i doing yeah um and uh, who am i when i'm doing it and why am i doing it and why is always the most important one yeah also it's, it's that why am i doing it what do i want from the other people and mm. what do i want from the audience as well to a degree i think that's an interesting one now when we think about putting our work online mm. who who are my audience and what do i want from them what do i need from them Oh, and I've got me thinking now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got another question here. Um, oh, this might take me into a dark place. Have you ever thought a production you worked on was going to fail and then been surprised by its success? I think that's every production <laughs> I work on. <laughs> I'm quite a pessimistic person. I'm like, I, and I think this is where imposter syndrome comes in, isn't it? Of that thing of... Um, even during Paralympics opening ceremony, this was me. No one's gonna watch it. No one's gonna care. Disabled <laughs> people. And then, like, you got Channel Four's highest viewing figures in years. You're like, oh, okay, someone did care. Um, so I, I, I think, yeah, I think every production. Uh, I've got the Tempest poster behind me, which I made with the Young Company at the Royal Exchange two years ago. That I took the Tempest, and between us. Uh, we tore it apart and we kind of put it back together uh, and it was a promenade piece it was it was we had big frank side bottom paper mache heads <laughs> that young people had made of people that they loved uh, I made the wedding a rock concert I put it at the end of the show rather than halfway through and um, we used the dining hall and there was still part of me that just went this is absolutely bonkers it's mm -hmm. not gonna work but you see that audience's responses and the young people's responses from being in it and you're just like, yeah, it, do, it does work. But I think I wouldn't be a very good director if I thought everything I, I make is going to be brilliant. Mm. I think you've always got to have that, that uncertainty. And also I think I've made shows and um, plays and I've still not been happy with them. Yes. Um, I am my worst critic. I really mm. am. It's like, or even, yeah, I can't, my partner, whenever he comes to see my shows, he's like, I can't sit near you because you're just, you're just like this all the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think, to be honest, every show I make, I think it's, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that, I, I don't know where that comes from. And maybe that just is that being a disabled woman, I, I always feel I have to work 150% mm -hmm. to be, to be noticed. So it's, it's almost like it's learnt behaviour but what society has put on me as a disabled person. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I, I certainly understand that feeling of um, it's never, 
there's a there's a thing in theatre which is you, you get to the dress rehearsal and you think if only we just had one more day just one more day and i'm sure you know if you were working the rsc and you had 10 weeks rehearsal time you'd still want just one more day yeah. um and you know I, I, I when any work that i've done i watch and i go i wish i never managed to fix that never managed to sort that out and yeah. maybe it's that striving that makes the work good that kind of constant questioning yeah. I, I think I remember we did um, cutting it. I did cutting it up here in, in January at the Royal Exchange Studio, and that is a that's a two hander. It's about FGM, and um, I worked with two two actors, uh, a deaf actor called Hermie Bahani and um, a young actor called Asha Hussain. Asha is only eighteen, so really raw talent, um, and Hermie. Um, she she vocalized but she also signed using sign supported english and there were moments where it was just pure pure signing um and everyone was like you're taking a massive risk and i'm like but i love it because they they're really embodying these characters and i remember we got to tech and that dress rehearsal is the first time you can see everything come together isn't it really and then you have that dress rehearsal and you're like oh this is not working but tonight we have our first preview and there's nothing you can do between that first dress rehearsal and that preview mm. and I remember sitting there that first preview don't get me wrong the actors did a great job but just thinking oh people are paying to see this I think we should just give them their money back now <laughs> um, but as soon as you see that work you go no that i need to take that out take that out we've we've put too much tech in we need to strip it back remember the story that we're trying to tell uh, and and it's it's a bit like a love story isn't it between those two girls until yeah. we get to the final bit um so it was just remembering that and i'd already kind of had that conversation with the tech team before and the creatives before we went into that preview so we all had that sort of eye on that mm -hmm. preview and then we had two days to kind of Reblock it, rework it, and get it to a place where I felt eighty percent confident on press night. And that's one of the peculiar things about making work online is that theatre's so much about audience response, and you you really don't know what it is that you've created until you see it in front of an audience. Yeah. With online work, you never get that opportunity. Um, yep. you, you can't be in the same room as the people who are watching it. You can't feel their excitement or their boredom or their um, it's it's quite a frustrating medium so far i've found to be working in but yeah i think i've found this i had um i was because i i because i'm part-time at grey i also work part-time at the royal exchange as a um, young company program leader and um i was offered the opportunity to direct the intergen project which is where the young company and the elders come together to make a piece of work and i jumped at this opportunity and i really wanted to work with the writer testament We'd done a little project before for Great Ormond Street. Um, and I had this idea that I wanted to do something around music and the connection of people through music. And we'd, we'd, we'd had some auditions, some R&D, and we, well, tiny bits of R&D, and we'd cast it. And then we went into lockdown. And the theatre were really, I think we all were, we knew the importance of this work and we wanted it to, to still make it. So it was, became, how do we put that online? And we did sessions on Zoom. I had not heard of Zoom until March the 17th. And I've just lived my life on it. Um, but, but we, you know, started making work on that. And we, we wanted to make uh, five episodes of something. Um, and the, the, the company came up with the characters. And we were working with people that were, it was on your, mo they were looking in on their mobile phones. One of the company doesn't have a printer or anything so would she get her script and she'd write it out by hand on paper so she had it then we had all that resume that you work out you can share the screen then we'd start recording and then you can't see what you're recording till after and then you'd realize you have to tick certain boxes in the zoom setup to not show the shared screen um yeah but what we became apparent was when we saw the first episode we created that was 30 minutes long we were like that this is 15 minutes too long we can't sit with these characters mm -hmm. like we can in theater you know in theater you can you can watch someone's every move and you're learning stuff about them bit by bit you can't do that on this digital platform 
it's a bit you, you have to move on so it was be, instead of being there with the red pen it was looking at the edit and going no cut this jump cut to this do that do that and it felt quite exciting for that week of that production week of we were still filming other episodes whilst we were editing the first two so it felt I felt like a proper TV production factory here in my own in my own home doing it remotely but it really got you to understand like what what you can achieve on a digital platform compared to what we're used to in theatre and it switches your head in a different way I'm not sure whether I'm sold on it yet no um, but knowing that a lot of the disabled community are going to still be indoors for a while, dare I say, because we're not quite sure how we trust the government at the moment. Um, and a lot of us are shielding that I think we have to look at what this digital platform can offer us to still make sure we can get our stories out there. Um, yeah, I'm kind of excited by it, but also I, there's nothing more than I love than being in the rehearsal room and, oh, yeah. and, 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 really, really and just those it. ideas. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's it's hard you can't do it you can't do it on here yeah um another question um can you think of a time in your career when you had a eureka moment and felt like this is what theater is all about that's in capitals so i'm, I'm trying to recreate that <laughs> either from a conversation or on stage or in the audience hmm. that's an interesting question a eureka moment this is what theater is all about I would say it was when I was working as a stage manager and we took, we took theatre into schools. And I remember we were doing BFG. It was just with three actors, a puppet. And it was seeing, it was receptions in year ones. And it was seeing their responses to helicopters on bits being flown round above their heads too and I still remember this how the the BFG had one of those little kids fishing nets and um he someone was um putting bubbles in the air and he would catch the bubble and he would put it in a jar and as he pressed the jar down the jar lit up to show he'd caught the dreams yeah. and it was magical but I always remember the responses it got from those young people that real like oh and I think being a stage manager that I could sit there and I could watch the audience I love watching audiences when mm. I get to watch theatre as well um, and when I make theatre and I think it was in that moment that I was like this this is what it's about it's about that response mm. it's about that moment of people's imagination we've taken them to a place in their school hall on a cold October morning we've taken them to this place of make-believe and they've gone there with us. And particularly when you think, you know, you're making work for young people that hardly went to the theatre. Some people didn't know you had to clap at the end. Mm -hmm. So I think that moment for me was like, th this is why I do what I do. Yeah, and, and that's what brings me back time and time again to Theatre for Young Audiences. Um, and I love those 9.30 in the morning shows in the school hall, but it's, it's extraordinary what, you can achieve just by being in the same room as someone and telling them a story yeah. um, and asking them to engage with it imaginatively. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think uh, young audiences are your most honest audiences, aren't they? Mm. That, that's what I've learned. If you can make a, a if you can make a piece of theatre that lasts 45 minutes and you only have two toilet, two people go to the toilet during that time, you're onto a winner. If, if you make a show and 10, 12 people go to the toilet throughout, you're a bit like, yeah, it's boring. They're not, they don't like it. So it judge your work on toilet breaks. Yeah, it was something that Kate Cross said last week about um, just allow children to be in the space watching the, the thing. You know, don't shush them. Don't, um, don't explain the story to them. Just let them, let them experience it and then you'll know the success of your work. Um, Definitely. Uh, which brings me on, actually, that was in response to um, my final question, which is, if you met the Theatre Genie and they could grant you one theatrical wish, what would it be and why? Okay. I would... To the Theatrical Genie, my wish would be, I wish that theatres could become more about uh, 
other people's narratives apart from the white male narrative mm -hmm. um, and, and and every theatre company and venue in the country has accessible work right. it's a big wish it's a big wish and and a call to arms to to us and to um to anyone thinking of going into the theatre industry and I, I think we should always bear that in mind that's it's a big wish but that, let's see what we can do um thank you so much nikki for joining us it's been so interesting talking to you and thank you for sharing so much of what you do and how you do it and how you ended up doing it no, thank um, you it's really really useful um and interesting and um also, we'd like to thank uh, the Arts Council England, um, who made these webinars possible through their emergency COVID funding. Um, next week, I will be talking to Gemma Brooks, who's a production manager. Uh, that's not maybe a job that you know anything about, but without production managers, theatre would not exist. And Gemma's um, been a production manager at many theatres and has also production managed events, including the Bristol Slapstick Festival. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with her. Um, and if you want to see the interview with Kate Cross um, or this interview with Nikki again, um, they're available on our YouTube channel um, and the details will, can be found on our website, which is www.roustabouttheatre.co.uk. Thank you very much and have a great week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.